Hello and welcome to Prime Time, watchmaking in the news. And can you believe this? This is already the 17th edition of this show where we talk about news, trends, and obviously watches. Crazy how fast time flies and a massive thanks for being with us all these years and fueling our enthusiasm with your comments and likes. And of course, well, for this special issue, we prepared a lot of exciting stories, business news, uh, product launches, some news about us too, but also what to expect in the coming weeks, plenty happening in Mexico, New York, Singapore, and more. Just watch till the end. So hop on board for another armchair trip with us and uh, for these long and dense uh, primetime editions where well, we've decided to, that we will from now on make a downloadable podcast version. Obviously nicer to see primetime with our additional video sequences here on YouTube on our, on our, or on our website. But for those who want to listen to us driving to work, well, you now have another option by using, for instance, Spotify. So let's now start uh, this prime time by congratulating our friend and CEO of H. Morser and company, Edouard Melan, on receiving the Gaia Prize in the entrepreneurship category. This is another outstanding proof of the work he has done for the brand, and we know that he is definitely not planning to slow down. Edouard uh, fully merits this prize. I mean, he managed to bring uh, to a quite conservative brand the so needed modern touch and innovative uh, technical dimension and made its uh, watches look really cool and even sexy. I mean, you can check the latest pieces of H. Morser in one of our videos from the Geneva watch days. And just to give you an idea of what the Gaia Prize is, well, it honors the very best uh, those uh, contributing to the reputation of watchmaking, its history, its technology or its industry. And this year's jury was a tough one to impress, starting from President uh, Regis Huguenin, curator of the Musée International d'Horlogerie of La Chaux de Fonds. Among others are watchmakers Carrie Wittelainen and Patrick Dubois, well-known watch journalist, editor-in-chief of the GHH magazine Joël Grandjean, and Serge Maillard of Europa Star. So watch enthusiasts were also there, and the founder and CEO of a collected man, Silius Walton, as well as guardians, if I can say so, of the watchmaking culture, François Aubert, president of the committee of the Musée d'Horlogerie du Locle of Château d'Emont, and Philippe Fischer, director of the Swiss Foundation for Research in Microtechnology. A nice panel. So the next good news puts a broad smile on my face, and this is something very dear to me and extremely important personally. I am proud to announce that in September we launched the horopedia.org website, which is part of the immense projects I've been working on with my team for the past month, not to say years. It is the first multimedia online dictionary dedicated purely to watchmaking, uh, to the watchmaking universe, naturally a very large uh, technical chapter, how watches are made and how they function, but also presentation of schools, museums, different institutions, men and women related to this complex uh, but exciting ecosystem, and our goal is to be as visual as possible. So for the time being, there is only a French version, but we are planning to have it translated into English, then German, and ultimately into 10 languages. This is, I mean, of course, just the tip of the iceberg, as with this launch, we wanted to show how comprehensive our approach is and to make uh, explicit the number of high value, uh, value added content to be produced and uploaded on the website, including text, illustration, videos, of course, and other images. And as this is a participative project, I would like to invite all those who wish to contribute to this encyclopedia to do so. Meanwhile, just go and check horopedia.org and leave us your comments below. Uh, but this initiative is indeed so big that we will soon return on the subject to share more information about the entire philosophy behind this project. And as to celebrate such an immense endeavor as the creation of Horopedia, well, Swiss Mint has launched a new special coin acknowledging Switzerland's watchmaking industry. The coin is called Time Machine, and it is also the first gold coin from Swiss Mint with a value face of 25 Swiss franc to enter circulation. So the importance of the Swiss uh, watchmaking industry and the worldwide popularity of its products are represented on the coin with the watch movement and the globe. And this uh, time machine coin shows a clock face and the cogs of a watch movement with the globe in the center. In the middle of uh, the reverse is another clockwork uh, cog wheel with a compass rose in the center. And the design was created by Remo Leinhardt from Beale. But if you're now thinking of adding this coin to your collection, well, you better hold your horses as it was limited to 4,750 units and was available, available for purchase for the price of 419 Swiss franc only online and just for uh, just for one day actually and all the pieces are already gone sorry about that 
Okay, next subject, and if you still want to spend your money, well, currently I would rather go to London. Thing is, with all the geopolitical tension, the US dollar is only gaining force, which led to the weakening of the British pound. And if we are talking about watches, well, here, that means that buying timepieces in the UK has become way cheaper than in the US. Add to this uh, the return of the VAT refund for non-UK residents and you could have a chance to get a Rolex 31% cheaper than in the US. I mean, this is of course if you're lucky enough to actually buy it in the store and that's a totally do different story. But the amusing math here is that Rolex, Patek, Omega, AP and other luxury watchmakers have already increased prices twice this year. It was done to maintain parity of prices in different countries to prevent a slump in sales in one market and a spike in another one. As people started shopping tours in search for the best value, though brands have uh, been imposed, uh, well, they've imposed quite strict purchasing rules favoring local customers. But the overall instability in the world could lead to further strengthening of the dollar and this will decrease the purchasing power of other currencies and create a bigger gap between retail and market prices on some watches. So the market apparently would be forced to adjust the prices one more time but I fear this is not yet a fair warning. And the silver lining of this situation is that the interest in watches as an investment tool is continuously growing despite a recent decline or adjustment on the secondary watch market, especially regarding certain models and brands. But we still have more auctions to come before the end of the year and my guess is that we will see more record sales ahead of us. And now I would like to talk about one video that some of you probably saw last month and I'm talking about the shocking video of a broad daylight robbery of man's Rolex while driving his Bugatti in London and apparently this is not the sole case. So according to London's Metropolitan Police there have been 621 robberies of luxury watches in the first seven months of this year. The sharpest rise in the number of watches robberies were in wealthy areas of the city of course but this is something that is happening not only in London. In uh, Los Angeles in the first six months of 2022 there have been at least 112 thefts involving at least one watch valued at $5,000 or more and Saint-Tropez suffered the scourge of muggings this uh, summer, which uh, made many watch owners carry their valuable timepieces in their pockets and put them the, putting them on uh, their wrist only at the restaurant or choosing to, less, uh, to wear less expensive and or less recognizable watches. So these are only examples and the worrying thing is that I believe this could have an impact on the appeal of uh, luxury watches. I mean you wear a watch uh, because you like it and you, it should be a simple thing but now with the fear of getting mugged well this could have a slight influence. Okay, I know that we're generally talking about some very wealthy enough people and their watches are most probably insured. But nevertheless, having to take into consideration the potentiality of violence because you're wearing a watch is a risk some will probably walk away from. And this is of course not great. On the other hand, maybe this can push uh, some luxury brands to adapt their supply according, uh, accordingly and go less bling and more discreet but technically uh, sophisticated nevertheless. And it's again another perfect excuse to go for lesser known brand and I'm talking about our friends from the independent side uh, of course. So to stay with London, last month we all said our solemn farewell to the longest reigning monarch in British history, Queen Elizabeth II. Of course this is not directly related to watchmaking but we cannot help but remember her exceptional choice of watchwear and we will mention only a couple of her favorite timepieces. Starting from the fantastic Gégé Le Coultre 101 called back then just Le Coultre and the watch was given to the Queen by former president of France Vincent Auriol and worn by Her Majesty for her coronation in 1953. Caliber 101 was developed in 1929 it was a pure revolution for fine watchmaking for women because of its remarkable miniature size. I'm pretty sure you've uh, seen a lot of pictures of this watch on the internet lately but it is indeed something quite admirable. Measuring 14 uh, millimeter long, 4.8 millimeter uh, in width and 3.4 millimeter in thickness and it is composed of 98 parts and weighs only one gram and it is still the smallest mechanical watch uh, movement produced so far. The other notorious piece is her Patek Philippe uh, reference 4975-1G Customized for the Sovereign, it is encrusted with diamond and is attached to a unique bracelet composed of multiple strands of pearls. She wore it on several occasions and even loaned the watch to Patek for its uh, watch art uh, grand exhibition in London a few years back. And being Swiss, well, we also have to remember her diamond Vacheron Constantin 44 81 which was given to the Queen in 1947 by the Swiss authorities on the day of her wedding 
to Philip Mountbatten, who then became Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. So apparently Queen Elizabeth's appreciation of fine Swiss uh, timepieces was cultivated through the years and it also looks like uh, King Charles III followed his mother's footsteps. At least uh, many have already noticed that for many years he stayed devoted to his Parmigiani Fleurier Toric chronograph which he bought in the early 2000s during one of uh, his uh, skiing holidays here in Switzerland in Klosters. And yes, this model is no longer in the rooster but this is, quite, uh, this is still quite impressive publicity for a relatively young brand launched in 1996 but uh, more and more aficionados have started to notice that the brand is getting back to the scene and I personally love their new Tonda BF which was also pre-selected by the way for the GPHG of this year. In September, I also attended the Watch Forum organized by our friends from Watches and Culture. And the topic of the discussion was sustainability and responsible growth in the time of climate change. Of course, in the watch community, I personally would prefer to think that we all believe in objects that are made to last, therefore are sustainable. And there are many examples of uh, green watchmaking as well. If only to name uh, some, uh, some of them, I mean, Oris uh, uses recycled packaging, Panerai uses recycled steel to produce its own e-steel metal, and Ulysse Nardin helps save sharks and repurposes its own energy. And I can totally get that for some, this is, uh, could be seen as some kind of green washing but at the same time any small initiatives uh, should be welcomed and contribute to an overall sense of consciousness. So during the forum we also heard about uh, the watch and jewelry initiative 2030 which looks like it's uh, slowly uh, becoming popular in the watchmaking community and if you haven't heard of it yet well this initiative was launched one year ago by Cartier, Kering, Chanel, Montblanc, Rosy Blue and Swarovski and it is focused on a science-based fight against climate change, uh, biodiversity protection, sustainable materials and business innovation. Iris uh, von der Becken, executive director and secretary general of this initiative, announced that 10 more brands recently joined this movement, among them uh, Langenzöne, IWC, uh, Geiger, Panerai and Piaget. Well, it's a good notion and of course we need to reduce our emissions, but I have spoken to some of the CEOs on the site and they agreed that the problem is less connected to the production side of watches and more to the marketing and the idea of the luxury lifestyle that often comes with it. Okay, let's now talk new watches and I would like to start with something that brings joy and inspiration when days become shorter and the temperature drops. So the RM88 from Richard Mille has uh, such a unique and bright design uh, that it would look perfect whether on a ski slope or on, uh, on a sailing boat. I mean, positive vibes included. So the watch has a skeletonized automatic winding tourbillon movement with the new in-house CRM T7 caliber, which took two years of development. And it is uh, shock resistant, which means that you can wear the watch on your, on your wrist while doing active sports. It has no major complication, uh, just hours and minutes and a simple function indicator, but the design is really quite something and follows a little bit in the footsteps of what we had seen a few years back with the candy collection, something I believe only RM can do and put it off. As you can see on the dial, I mean, there's an array of miniature sculptures of flamingo, cocktail glass, pineapple and cactus around this smiley feature, which is in fact a barrel bridge. And most of these sculptures have been done by Olivier Kuhn, a man you recently saw on, your ch on our channel when we talked about his amazing Pearl of the Dragon piece, another fine example of his engraving talent. And if you haven't seen it, well, I clearly invite you to do so. Really impressive work. The RM88 uh, Smiley is a limited edition of 50 pieces and this is something I really like because I think this number is related to the anniversary of the original Smiley drawing made by Franklin Lufrani just over 50 years ago. A symbol we use all the time and serve as the embodiment of positivity, joy and sharing. Okay, next timepiece with the Audemars Piguet Ultra Thin Royal Oak Flying Tourbillon RD3 that I have here with me. It comes in a 37 mm steel case, has this uh, quite funky violet petite tapisserie dial and takes uh, most of the design elements seen early this year with the new version of the Jumbo for the 50th anniversary of this icon. Here the main particularity of this timepiece resides in its thickness, 8.1 mm overall, which is made possible thanks to an ultra-thin 3.4 mm movement directly coming out of AP's R&D department and initially introduced to us back in 2019 when the brand had shown us the RD2, the world's thinnest self-winding perpetual calendar of its time. 
But that watch had a diameter of 41 mm and the challenge with this one was to reduce the size of the movement in order to encase it in this 37 mm case. Okay, you don't have all the gears needed for a QP but this has allowed the AP team to reduce its thickness further and host a specially developed flying tubing on beating at 3 Hz for this new caliber 2968. This piece is part of the brand's 50th commemoration of the Royal Oak as you can see with this uh, 50 logo part uh, on the rotor. It won't be limited, but limited by production capabilities and I'm pretty sure that we'll see uh, different colors in the future. All right, uh, next uh, timepiece is on the list and this is something a bit less technically complicated and much more affordable, but I'm particularly pleased to tell you about it because it is made by the Swedish brand Nezumi and for a half Swede, well, I had you know, to talk about this. So these guys started the journey in 2011 in Stockholm as a creative agency and made their first watches, the Voiture, in 2015. By the way, the origin of the brand's name has nothing to do with Sweden or Swedish culture. It comes from a Japanese Robin Hood called Nezumi Kozo, who stole from the rich a samurai and gave it to the poor. Quite an ambiguous choice for the name, I'd say, but the brand supports many charity, which is good. So back to the watches uh, we have here. And this is the Corbeau chronograph and uh, the design perfectly reflects the name which is translated into uh, in English as Raven. Everything here is as black as possible. The black dial with these three uh, sub dials and the bezel which is highlighted only by superluminova markings. And it comes with a black uh, NATO strap made out of hard wearing Terrian nylon. So for those who don't like all black, well, there are two more colors for the strap, gray and gold. The chronograph is uh, quite uh, small, 40 uh, millimeter. And it is waterproof to 50 meters and is powered by the VK63 Mecha Quartz hybrid movement by Seiko. And all watches are assembled in Germany and I would uh, give them kind of 8 points out of 10 considering the, the price. I mean they are quite cool, uh, sporty and robust. They do have a resemblance with the Swedish Air Force watches, uh, Lemania Vegan from the 70s which inspired the brand. And I kind of like this vintage look and for the price of less than, you know, 300 US dollar where it's quite a good deal. And as I already mentioned, another model of the brand, the voiture, well here it is. Okay, it's not the, the very first watch that I talk about, but this is a new release to celebrate the 10th anniversary of Nezumi. This is a 100% mechanical chronograph with the Swiss Celita SWU510, manual wound movement and a 58 hours of power reserve. The design of this watch is inspired by the 60 and 70 era uh, and has a little kind of a Paul Newman vibe to it. I mean the metal bracelet naturally also reminds us of other things. And uh, here I have the blue dial but it is also available with the white and black dial, uh, limited only to 100 pieces per color. And the price is also quite um, affordable, slightly above uh, 1,300 US dollar. Well, that was a lot of information so far, but we're not done yet, of course not. Now let's uh, check the watch fairs for October. And as uh, I promised in the beginning, well, good things is that most of them are happening at the end of the month. So you still have uh, time to book your tickets. So first is the CR, which celebrates its 16th edition this year, the most important event in the, of the industry in Latin America, which will take place from October 18 to the 20th in Mexico City. Seriously, something not to miss as it grows every year and quite an acknowledgement for the huge uh, watch market of Latin America. And I mean, brands always come up with uh, something new for this region, like the Chopal LUC Perpetual Tea Spirit of La Santa Muerte, which was sold in six minutes la last time. And once you have uh, checked all the novelties in Mexico, well, your next destination will be New York and two watch events at the same time. I personally have no idea how to split between the wind up watch fair and watch time, which will take place both on October 21st to the 23rd. Wind Up is intended to be the largest show and already announced that its uh, new venue will be twice the size of the previous venue in Chelsea Market and Watchtime has published a quite promising program of work on its website. So I leave you to make your personal choice here, probably go to both, uh, but it's great to know that the watchmaking culture is constantly evolving and has these kind of show. So last but not least is of course the Singapore Watch Fair that takes place on the 26th 
to the 13th of October. Some of you uh, may have heard about this show by its former name, Jewel Lux, but this time it will be more focused on watches and the watch market and challenges it faces at the moment. So such fairs by definition are extremely important because they are focused on finding new ways of approaching customers while fulfilling their demands. And it would be quite interesting to hear some of the panels to understand the direction Asian market is about to take. And let uh, me finish this prime time with two books we uh, that are, were recently published. The first one, and we'll talk again about AP, as this book is dedicated to the 50th anniversary of the Royal Oak and is entitled Royal Oak from Iconoclast to Icon. The author is an award-winning cultural journalist and former deputy uh, editor of British GQ, Bill Prince, and the book presents the Royal Oak's uh, history from a broader cultural perspective and includes the new archival materials uncovered by AP, uh, AP's Heritage Department. This is definitely something to enjoy during the long autumn evenings while sipping your whiskey on the rocks. So the book is a pure pleasure, I mean with images from six, six decades of groundbreaking art, architecture, fashion, music and cultural history. And it is indeed hard to say whether it was uh, historical events that forced the evolution of this iconic timepiece since its first release in 1972 or if it was the Royal Oak that inspired the history. Who knows? I mean, whichever it was, this book is a remarkable tribute to the heritage of the Royal Oak and to the people who have contributed to, the, to this success. The second book comes from our friend of uh, MBNF and is dedicated to 15 years of the brand's history. Actually, it's not a book, it is a first catalogue raisonné, a comprehensive and annotated, annotated listing of all the known works of the brand. It is huge and has 37 chapters written by another good friend of Watchers TV, a watch journalist uh, that you may know, Susan Wong, and William Massena of Massena Lab. Here you will not find historical anecdotes or cultural references as in the AP book, but, but for an avid watch collector this is a pure gem because this catalogue contains detailed information about every single timepiece produced by MBNF from the years 2005 to 2020. And this includes prototypes and pieces that were not officially announced before. And all in all, there are 160 products variation along with it, uh, with over 400 photographies. And uh, as we all like everything limited, well, the first one will consist of 2,000 copies sold in a special protective box made of the same high-density foam used to package MBNF timepieces. Quite a collectible, I would say. And you can purchase it directly on MBNF's uh, website. By the way, during the Genie Watch days, MBNF made its own Hall of Fame and showed all 20 calibers that uh, have been invented in 17 years, which is indeed quite uh, spectacular if you ask me. Literally a new caliber every single year. So regarding the AP book, it is published by Asuline and you can buy it directly on their website. So that's more or less it for today. I hope you've enjoyed this anniversary edition of Primetime and I would like to thank you again for all your comments regarding our work. It really means a lot and coming back on one of our latest videos, I am very happy you guys enjoyed the first episode of our follow-up on the development of Jean-Claude Beaver's brand. We like to do those and more episodes will of course follow. And just as a little teaser, we will soon publish another one of these long testimonial videos as we had the pleasure of hosting a man here in our Geneva club space who has been extremely influential in making what watchmaking has become today, especially regarding the secondary market. This man is Osvaldo Patrizzi, co-founder of Antiquorum, and with him we will come back on his journey with some uh, fun anecdotes, interesting anecdotes, and his view on what is currently going on. But we have of course more, but one surprise after the other. Anyhow, see you real soon and a very warm uh, Viva watchmaking from Geneva. All the best. And yes, I know this was a pretty long one, but remember that you can now download this as a podcast. More info on our website. Bye.